Can you make fine art out of scrap yarn? Let's find out. Choosing a classic painting for this project was difficult, but when all else fails, puns shall prevail. In this video, I'll be attempting to net the girl with a pearl earring. That's P-U-R-L to you and me. First, I needed a canvas, and although they're normally woven, it totally made sense to knit this one. Initially, I wanted to use a four-ply cotton for the main panel, but in the end I decided to go with a different DK yarn that I already had, because it was closer to the average weight of all the yarn I had. What was that? I think it might just be a sigh of relief. I really wasn't joking about the pearl. It's a pearl to pearl. Get it? To get the dimensions for the painting, I used an image of the original and pixelated it according to the tension of my DK yarn. As you can imagine, knitting images is basically pixel art, so this was all pretty straightforward, theoretically. Was it technically a pattern? Sure, but this simple, paint-by-numbers concept was misleading, to say the least. More on that later, but now onto the blocking. Which I suppose you could compare to the stretching and priming of a canvas, except instead of using an acrylic based priming medium, I used an acrylic yarn, which was a bit of a problem. Some of you may already know what I'm about to say, but essentially, blocking acrylic is no walk in the park. The synthetic fibres do not surrender easily to the universal solvent that is H2O. This means that heat is often required, and even then, you may just have to kill it anyway. To anyone who thought otherwise, I'm not being dramatic. Killing acrylic is actually a thing. I wanted to try steaming this into submission first, and if that didn't do anything, then yarn slaughter would be the last resort. I promise I did actually steam it properly. It was just too much fun pretending that this was a retro first person shooter. Now while we wait for everything to dry, let's talk about yarn. Despite also having a scrap yarn monster that every fibre artist must feed and house rent-free throughout the years, it turned out that mine is still just a baby. This means that not all of the yarn I'll be using will be scrap, technically, but rest assured, it will be when I'm done with it. I didn't want to buy or dye a bunch of new yarns, because this is meant to be a challenge, so I'll be diving into my existing yet limited stash for the missing colours. All of that being said, some of my yarns are barely used, so although I I don't really feel like scrap is an appropriate descriptor, they are still left over from previous projects, and it got me wondering, what do you guys count as scrap yarn? I also remembered that I had an embroidery frame that had yet to see any embroidery, so I decided to put it together to help stretch out the knit panel. It should make things easier? Oh look, the blocking should be ready now. Oh dear. Okay, that didn't work out, but part of me had already suspected it wouldn't, so the disappointment was minimal. At least I'd finished gathering most of the colours I needed. In order to make this a whole lot less unbearable, for lack of a better term, I also reduced the number of colours in my pixelated reference in the hopes of preserving my sanity. That being said, I planned on referring to both images instead of just one. Would I regret this in time? Let's not beat around the bush. Yes. Yes, I would. That's a lot of yarn. I'm really hoping that this will work as a stand for the frame. Let's give it a go. So here is my frame with my very curly panel of knitting. Okay, promising so far. I don't think it's designed to take anything of this size. Most of the work will be duplicate stitched, which kind of counts as knit, but in practice is a lot closer to embroidery. You can check out my tutorial for this stitch if you'd like to try it out. My main tool for this will be this needle here. It's one of those with a blunt tip, which means that it won't separate the strands of the yarn. So the pearl stitches here will basically be my anchor, and I'll use it to triangulate all of the other colours and stitches. <laughs> I think I want this stitch. No, I think this is the right one. <laughs> <laughs> 
Using the purl stitches to figure out the placement, I doubled up some brown sports waist cotton and began making my first stitches for the shadow of the face. Soon enough, I realised that not only was this overkill, but it was also slightly annoying to work with, so I gave up and went with a single strand. Honestly, the coverage wasn't that bad, and as long as I loosened the twist a little, it worked out fine. For the darker shades, I then tried using a brown wool that was a slightly richer tone, because it looked darker even if it kind of wasn't. At this stage, it was time to try mixing yarns, like you would mix paint. You would think it makes sense, right? I had this light brown roving esque yarn that I thought might be able to blend with a darker wool. The main concern was that it was an acrylic wool blend, and although it was majority wool, it didn't have the same blending capabilities as 100%. Regardless, I went ahead to see how it would work out. I hate this so much. Yeah, we're not doing that anymore. I'd like to think it was at least worth the try. I'm going to take it off the frame because it feels like it's getting in the way. Taking this off the frame made me realise something. It suddenly dawned on me that I had just embarked on the most questionable and convoluted duplicate stitching sample ever. But as we must in times just like these, I crammed those thoughts into a tiny little box and put them on a shelf for bedtime, because the day cannot possibly end until you allow your demons to get the better of you. Stay humble. After several colour changes, I was beginning to notice that the yarn ends were starting to get in the way of stitching. Tidying them was definitely a task to keep on top of, because it was only going to get worse, exponentially. This is also where things started to get pretty confusing. I needed several shades of brown to beige, but I couldn't remember which yarn I'd allocated to which colour, which meant that I had to go over all the work I did at the beginning. To show you just how similar these shades are, even though I'm using my darkest shade to go over some of the slightly lighter brown, it barely makes a difference other than in texture, which I guess is still valid since it reflects light differently. We all know that projects often look wrong before they look right, but this was taking the biscuit. In fact, it looked more like a biscuit than a face, let alone a girl with an earring, that's for sure. Having warmed up a bit and gotten over the initial hiccup, which was more of a shrill cry for help, I then started to introduce a lighter peach yarn for the majority of the face. Things were not looking good, as if that wasn't already abundantly clear but I knew better than to judge a cake before it was baked. And so, I just spent the next several hours having no clue as to what in the world I was bringing into existence. I should say that, although I was following the references I made earlier, the poor excuse for colour matching meant that whether or not this would work was still very much yet to be seen. If I squinted long enough, I could see the resemblance, and although currently it did look like a failed art restoration Jesus, there was still much work left to be done. At this point, it became apparent that switching between my two grid references was an unrealistic approach. I was seeing double in double ways. Since going over stitches wasn't doing any real damage, I figured that it would be a good idea to approach this piece in layers, like actual painting itself. So I would start by laying down the foundation on my limited colour reference, and then add on top of it using the more true to life reference. Eventually, the base for the face was complete and successfully portrayed my emotional state at the time. The expression very much reminded me of Edvard Munch's The Scream. So the next step was to colour in the mouth, but before I could finish, all of a sudden a beast appeared before my weary eyes. It was Saturn, devouring his son. Oh no. This wasn't quite the fine art experience I signed up for, but it was dramatic. I'll give it that. I think the sensible idea would be to start from the bottom, because I find that duplicate stitching is just easier when you work in this direction. However, it's going to be a lot more of the beiges and browns. So I'm going to start off with the blue portion of the head wrap, and then I'll go back down and work on this part here, and then I think I'll work on the lower part of the head wrap. Like I said, I wanted to move on to the head wrap. Okay. The history of which turned out to be kind of surprising but I'll get into that later on. At this moment in time, I was struggling to figure out my bearings. So to be on the safe side, I decided to work from the bottom up with a khaki green to put down more points of reference. Again, this green was kind of in the right ballpark, but it wasn't quite dark enough. Although, that wasn't to say that it wouldn't add a nice dimension to the shadow. Finally, it was back to the top part of the headscarf, and the darkest blue was just one solid block. 
Fortunately, working without the frame meant that I could stretch my legs, because somehow this stitching was taking a physical toll. And while I do that, here's a short and not so sweet art history segment. The girl with the pearl earring was painted by Johannes Vermeer at around 1665. Blah blah blah, yada yada. What we really care about is who was she and what was she wearing? Foolishly, I didn't even look this up until I was halfway done with this project, so your girl kinda messed up. You see, this painting isn't actually a portrait, it's a trony. What's the difference? I don't really know. But apparently tronies are meant to convey things other than just the person and how they looked, so we don't know who she was exactly. What we do know is that this headscarf is referred to as a quote, oriental turban. Long story short, it sounds an awful lot like cultural appropriation. appropriation. It's hard to tell with such little context, but again, it was a 17th century, so I'll leave you to fill in the blanks. Some would even go as far as to say that the girl had little to do with why it was painted. There are several theories of who she actually was in relation to Vermeer himself, and that's a whole other essay by itself. However, something I find more fascinating is how Scarlett Johansson, who plays a girl in the movie that I have not seen, shares the same name as the painter. Johansson literally means son of Johan, which is the same name as Johannes. Coincidence? I mean, some theorize that the girl was actually Vermeer's daughter, so the real question is this. Does this prove that time travel exists? No one tells you about the potential physical asymmetry that can occur with duplicate stitching. My right arm felt ambushed by the unexpected workout, and my left felt left out. And then the obvious occurred. I could just use my left hand. A few more finishing touches with a grey yarn I pulled from an old crochet sample, and the head was mostly done. Now it was time to start from the bottom and work my way upwards. This was a little more difficult since a lot of the stitches were further apart. I'm kind of thinking that maybe I should have added a few more rows as a border, but I also like the fact that I haven't. I guess it all depends on what I decide to do with this after I'm done. I really had to concentrate and make sure I was stitching in the right places, otherwise it had the potential to throw everything else off. I also ended up messing up towards the top and had to take it out and redo it because a yarn was an iron weight that couldn't be stitched over discreetly. After the perfect selection of blues, the yellow options I had lined up were kind of a difficult pill to swallow. Because I don't have the right shades for the garment she's wearing. So what I do have is this kind of yellow, maybe goldish chenille yarn. And I also have this much lighter yarn, as well as a very yellow yarn that I used for my chucky sweater. Um, yeah, we'll just have to see how it looks. Needless to say, I was not optimistic about how this part would turn out, so most of my energy was spent bracing myself. Remember, there's no disappointment if there's no hope to begin with. I don't want to do it. Oddly enough, it wasn't looking as bad as I had anticipated, and despite the limitations, it was, at the very least, looking recognisable. Plus, the mixture of textures was interesting. That's all I can really hope for at this point. The main thing to focus on now was getting everything in the exact place. So I think I've missed a couple of rows here, they should actually be a little bit higher, which means that this part should also be a little bit higher, which means that I'm going to- Although I knew what to do, and that it really wasn't a big deal to fix things, it still felt like I messed up, and the only way to get rid of that feeling was to put it right. Looking back, the mistakes and fixes added some extra textural effects, and made the whole piece that little bit more interesting. And I guess art is more about the constant internal conflict than anything else, which would explain a lot. The project had become a business in the front, party in the back situation, and now that the party was over, it was time to clean up. The great thing about the duplicate stitching was that the more I stitched, the more crowded the knit underneath it all got. This meant that dealing with yarns was super easy, and I eventually stopped tying them all together and wove them in at the beginning and end of each yarn change. Now it was time to add the white for the collar. I then used the same yarn to highlight parts of the upper face, although, disappointingly, the contrast wasn't that noticeable. 
For some finishing touches, I basically needed to fill in what seemed like dead pixels, and that just meant scattering each colour around wherever they were needed. It was tedious, but that was nothing new. The garment was finally complete, and although it barely matched the original in a very technical and objective sense, subjectively, it hit the nail on the head, for me at least, anyway. I can't tell if she's screaming, sulking, or just had a bad filler job. And yeah, the eyes. I can't. I think at this stage I had already accepted the fact that it was likely that nothing could be done about them. So I moved on to the draped fabric. And to no surprise, my yarn options were even less suited for this part. Without realising it, I had saved the trickiest colour matching for last, and this was definitely the final boss moment. In the end, I had to reuse some colours, even though they didn't quite match. The fabric was a lighter yellow than both the garments and any yarn I had available. Seeing as I had already used all the yellows and golds for the dress, I had to find another way. After another search, I found a swatch made with the yellowish cream yarn from my shorts videos, and I was hoping that it would create a decent base. Unfortunately, it didn't quite do the trick, so while I figured out how to fix it, I moved on to detailing the face. I was really looking forward to improving this in any way possible. The face still gave restored Jesus Christ, so I tried to add some more definition to the mouth with a mid pink and a cherry red followed by some contrast to the eyes and a half-stitched contour to the nose bridge. This is now a beauty channel, minus the beauty, but with all the drama. I also added a few highlights with a white yarn, as the museum website describes the girl's lips as moist. Don't shoot the messenger. The face was about as good as it was ever going to get, so it was back to the yellow situation. All I really had to do was create the illusion of a light shade of yellow, so I took my lightest yellow and separated the strands so that I could work with them individually. Anywho, the gold detailing had a sort of lame effect, and although it didn't quite achieve the desired effect, I really liked the way it looked. It was during this task that I quickly realised this really could go on forever. I even thought about adding beading embellishment and different stitch types. The possibilities were endless and assuming that infinity does exist, I could technically go on and on until this portrait eventually becomes the real original painting itself. And with that, I knew I had to put an end to it. Or should I say, pearl an end to it. With the stitching, I mean painting, finally complete, I wanted to give steam blocking another try. This time I was going to steam even closer, and for longer. I think the sides need a little bit of work, but other than that I think it's held down pretty well. And now, for the grand reveal. Honestly, I don't think it turned out too badly. Would I call it fine art? No, but I would call it fiber art, and I'm pleasantly surprised at how far duplicate stitching can take you. The only question now was what to do with it. Join me next time when I'll be crocheting a Bob Ross tutorial. I really hope that's a joke.